which means uh, um, planar disk. And then Frank is going to discuss a more general case with other shapes where particles have other shapes. This is a joint work in collaboration with Frank Den Hollander, Sabine Janssen, and Roma, Roman Koteski. Um, so let me start from uh, uh, a general overview uh, about what metastability is. So um, we can say that metastability is a phenomenon where a system um, is under the, which is under the influence of some stochastic dynamics is moving on uh, um, different regions of the state space on different time scales. So normally what we, we will see is that the system um, reaches quasi equilibrium uh, very fast in a single subregion. But on a slower time scale, we will see that the system does transition between, between different uh, subregions. So the, exist, the, pres the presence of these uh, two time scales where the system behaves differently denote uh, metastability. But um, we also have a more um, general, uh, uh, a more physical uh, um, uh, interpretation of metastability. Because in physics, metastability can be described as uh, the dynamical manifestation of a first um, order phase transition. So uh, everybody uh, probably knows this, uh, this diagram where P means pressure, T is the temperature. And the solid, the liquid, and the gas phase are present and separated by coexistence lines. So um, what we know is that if we cross these coexistence lines, the system change phase. But what we observe is that uh, the system, if we start, for instance, in the gas uh, phase and we um, 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 and we um, uh, lower the temperature. What we observe is that the system will not uh, quickly change its phase, but will uh, persist for a very long time in a metastable state before transi transiting to the new um, stable state. So this transition is going to take a very long time. And um, we would like to give a mathematical uh, proof of this uh, delay. So, um, what is important in order to study metastability is to look at, uh, first of all, to look at the free energy. So the free energy um, is, is giving us the picture at equilibrium and um, the quantities of interest are the multiple minima of the free energy, which are obtained when I choose uh, um, a, a parameter regime, um, which is give me uh, the phenomenon of metastability. Once I, I have that the, the free energy has multiple minima, then I look at the critical points of F and I will see that F will have local minima, global minima, um, global minimum, and uh, some saddle points in between. And I interpret the local minima as metastable states and the global minimum is the stable state because we know that uh, from statistical mechanics, we know that uh, um, system want to be in the minima of the free energy. Okay, so um, in between I will have these saddle points. And the, the main question is, um, what is the mean heating time? So what is the mean time that the system needs to go to arrive to the stable state starting from a metastable state? So this is the key question here. Why is mean heating time? Well, because the dynamics is stochastic, so this time is going to be random. Um, what we know uh, from physics and from chemistry is that um, when metastability is present, the time the system needs to go from a metastable state to a stable state is following the Arrhenius law. So the mean time is exponentially big when n is going to infinity, n is like the the number of particles, if you want, um, times uh, delta F, um, where delta F is the height of the free energy uh, on the saddle point. This is a very uh, simple case. And this is what is observed uh, physically when you have a condensation. So um, another question, so one question is the mean heating time, but another um, um, question is also, 
uh, what are the typical configurations of the system on top of the saddle point? So how um, does the system look uh, here on the saddle point? Um, so what is going to happen is that the system starts on, a, on in a in a local minimum, and then it's going to, to go up, but this is very costly. So it will go back and it's going to do this, this thing many, many times until it's going to reach um, um, critical size and uh, a critical droplet is going to be um, formed. And after this system reach the critical size is going to condensate if we want to have this uh, the idea of condensation uh, as, as a prototype example. Um, so um, what happens is that um, here we are interested to study models in the continuum. And um, metastability has been successfully studied um, in, uh, in several, for several models, which are on the lattice. Um, but continuum systems are very hard to be to be studied because they have a, a much higher degree uh, degree of freedom uh, to analyze. So uh, what we what we know is that uh, already because we we said that uh, metastability is the dynamical version of a phase transition, but a rigorous proof of the presence of phase transition for a continuum system, say um, modeling a fluid, has been achieved to my knowledge, uh, in dimensions higher than one, only for uh, two models. One is the widom rollinson model, uh, introduced by Ruel. Well, actually, it was introduced by Widom and Rollinson, but um, studied rigorously by Ruel in 71. And a model uh, with cuts potential um, with a two-body attractive and a four-body repulsive interaction by Lebovitz, Mazel, and Presutti. So, what we would like to do is we would like to, um, to, to study metastability for continuum systems. And uh, what we are going to do is we focus on the first model. And we try to adapt what has been done in the discrete uh, um, setting. So here I, I'm, I wrote the, the two main monographs about uh, metastability, one by Olivier and Vares and one more recent by Bovier and then Hollander. Um, and the first one uh, is uh, using the so-called pathwise approach uh, to metastability, while the second one focus on uh, uh, potential theoretic approach. Um, okay, so this is the state of the art. And now I would like to uh, introduce the model. So uh, the widom rollinson model is a model for fluids that uh, has the follow following uh, description at uh, um, equilibrium. We take a torus in two dimensions. So Widom and Rollinson have introduced this model for general dimensions, but we will work in two dimensions. Um, so this is a torus. And inside the torus, we have a particle configuration, which is just a bunch of points in this torus. So the, the, the particles are these um, black dots. Uh, N of gamma, so gamma is a configuration, N of gamma is the cardinality of gamma or also the number of particles. Uh, what we want to de define is uh, the halo of a configuration. So what we are going to do is we draw disk around these uh, black dots and the halo of a configuration is given by the union of the disk of radius one and center X, where X is part of the con configuration of particles gamma. So the all over configuration, so th these are the disk that I can draw around each of these centers. And the halo is just this shaded, uh, darker region. Um, I'm going to use the following notation. So uh, the cardinal, so the, the, the cardinality, the, the the area of this uh, halo um, H of gamma is called V of gamma. This is a notation that I'm going to use very often. V stands for volume, but actually we are in two dimensions. So it's going to be an area and surface. And the Hamiltonian then of the system is given by um, V of gamma minus N times pi. So what is this Hamiltonian? Is uh, the total area of the halo so the shaded region minus the area of a single disk multiplied by the number of particles. 
this um, Hamiltonian is always negative. It's going to be zero when they are when when these disks have no intersection, and it's going to be minimal when all the disks are on top of each other. And the minimum value is uh, minus n minus one pi. Okay, so this is a model for a fluid where particles have the tendency to 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 stick together. Why do I say it's a model for a fluid? Uh, for the following reason, because it has a phase transition. Um, so we want to work in the grand canonical. This means that the probability that I see a configuration gamma in the, con in the, in the continuum, so d gamma, is given by, um, so we have a reference measure, which is a Poisson point process with intensity one. We have the Gibbs factor, the Boltzmann factor, e to minus beta h, where h is the Hamiltonian that I just described, and where beta is the inverse temperature, so it's uh, always positive. Then we have the activity z raised to the number of particles, and here we have the normalization of the Gibbs measure, which is the partition function psi. Now, it, <clears throat> if I look at, um, at this model, I will see that this model has a phase transition. This means the following, that there exists a coexistence line. Meaning that if I um, I, I can write um, the coexistence line as a function of uh, the inverse temperature beta in this way, and it's exactly this red line. So when beta is smaller than some beta critical, I will see a single phase. So nothing happens in this area. But when beta is bigger than beta critical, I will see that I have two phases: uh, the gas phase and the liquid phase. So this is really a coexistence line for beta bigger than beta critical. And this, um, the occurrence of a phase transition at the thermodynamic limit, so when this uh, torus grows and invades the whole space, has been proved in any dimension um, bigger than one by Ruel first in 71, and then by Chase, Chase, and Koteski in 95. So uh, are there questions about the static model? If not, uh, I will go to the dynamic with the Rollinson model. Now, because we want to study metastability and we said that metastability is uh, a phenomenon occurring when a system is uh, subject to a stochastic dynamics, we have to, um, to look at the, a dynamical version of the William Rollinson model. So now particle configurations gamma at our view as a continuous time Markov process. So we have this process gamma T with state space gamma and with the following generator. So this is kind of a birth and death process where particles are added at the rate beta and removed at the rate D. So notice that uh, the rate at which I add the particle, so this is the rate at which I add a particle in the point X given a configuration gamma. And this is given by the chemical potential or the activity Z times E2 minus beta, the change of the Hamiltonian when I add a new particle. While I remove a particle at rate one, where X is belonging to the configuration gamma. This choice is the usual heat bath dynamics and is chosen in such a way that the grand canonical Gibbs measure is reversible. So the question is now can be um, um, can be said in a really uh, e is really easily uh, not so much the answer to the question but the question itself is a very <laughs> naive one. So we choose the the um, uh, the activity Z to be kappa times the critical activity Z critical of beta, where kappa is bigger than one. This means the following thing. Let me go back one second to the coexistence line. I want to be slightly above the coexistence line. I want to, to, to uh, prepare my, uh, my model in, this, uh, in the liquid phase somehow. Um, and I want to look in the regime when beta is going to infinity and the torus is fixed. I want to find the asymptotics of the mean heating time. So 
the the main goal is to uh, to write the asymptotics for this mini heating time when I start from the empty box and I arrive to the full box. So the empty box is just uh, you know you have no particles, and the full box is are all the configurations where the halo is invading the whole torus. So uh, this, uh, if I find the, the, the asymptotics for the mean heating time, it means that I have condensated. I, I started from a, from a very rarefied gas and I arrived to a very dense uh, liquid. So this is the definition of the mean of the heating time, and I want to compute the average. Um, okay, so this is the main question now. Um, so let's see what are what are the main objectives then. Um, so before writing the main theorem, I want I have to stress the following that um, I now want to introduce a function phi cap of r, which is the following downward parabola. This is the formula, and it which has a maximum in r critical of kappa, which is a function of kappa described by this curve here. So what is this phi of kappa, kappa of r? Now, the theorem says the following thing. I choose a value of kappa. So remember that kappa is this value um, that, I, that I have to choose in such a way to be slightly above the coexistence line. And then what I find is that uh, the expectation, the mean hitting time when I start from the empty set and when I arrive to the full set, is exponential of beta times phi of kappa minus beta one third times another another function of kappa called psi of kappa plus smaller orders when beta is going to infinity. What is this uh, phi of kappa and psi of kappa? Phi of kappa is nothing but this function in the um, maximum. So he here there is the explicit formula. While psi of kappa has another dependency on kappa, is this formula here, where s is a certain constant coming from a microscopic model, which we'll uh, describe at the end of the talk. So uh, this is in the form of an, of an Arrhenius law. But what is uh, very challenging of this theorem is that is to find the second the, the, the correction to the classical Arrhenius law. So we will we see that um, in the continuum we have uh, um, the, the, the main order is of course beta times uh, um, something which resemble um, a free energy, but the correction is of the order beta one third times uh, um, something which will resemble um, a surface kind of phase trans of um, of uh, free energy, and I will explain this in a second. Um, so in this way, we have a full picture of the mean heating time. The second question is the cri critical droplet. So what is the gate in order to do this crossover? What happens on the saddle point? And um, what, 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 uh, what happens is that uh, for every choice of kappa, so now every uh, result is going to have this dependency on kappa, which is telling me how super critical I choose my chemical potential somehow. Then what happens is that when beta is going to infinity with probability one, knowing that I do the crossover, I will pass through a configuration C delta, where the configuration is C delta are all the particle configurations which have a halo very close to a disk with critical radius r c of cup. So here I'm saying that uh, on top of the on top of this hill, the system will have an isotropic configuration which resembles a disk, a big disk, and you would see that all these disks will arrange nicely around uh, this big disk. This big disk will have a radius r c of cup which is the RC of kappa that I introduced before. So the critical droplet is close to this uh, disk and uh, has uh, the boundary, which is a random. And what we are going to see is that it has an order beta disk in the bulk, in the interior, 
and order beta 130 disk on the boundary. That's why phi of kappa scales with beta and represent the volume free energy associated with the critical droplet, while psi of kappa scales with beta one third and is going to represent a surface free energy of the critical droplet. Sorry, and uh, this is on torus, on torus. Yes. Is a, is, yes, the particles are inside a two-dimensional torus, which is fixed, big enough, but fixed, big enough to contain this, uh, um, this disk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, remember that the, 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 the limit we are considering is the limit for beta to infinity, but fixed uh, torus. Okay. Um, now, before going into details, I would like to, um, to, to say a few words, really a heuristic idea of why we have this beta and this beta one third. Um, so this is a very uh, simple uh, reflection that I want to do before diving into the technicalities. Now, because we are in the metastable regime, the chemical potential is going to be, as I said before, kappa times the z-critical, and which I can rewrite. Uh, so the z-critical has this shape. So let me rewrite the, the birth rate. The birth rate is kappa times beta times e to minus beta, the difference of, the, of, of these volumes, which are surfaces, when I add a particle. So the first reflection that one does is the following. Okay, suppose that you have a cluster of particles which is already created inside your system. Remember that particles are only added or removed. So the number of particles is not conserved. The particles cannot move around. So it's like kind of a Glauber dynamics. Um, so if you have already this cluster gray, you will add a particle inside the cluster at rate kappa beta because this, this uh, difference is not is going to give you zero because the difference of the shape um, is zero. You are adding a particle inside. This means that inside the droplet, uh, we will observe a Poisson point process with a very high intensity, which is kappa beta. That's why inside the bulk of this critical droplet, we will have order beta particles. Of course, if I put a particle here, this factor is going to be um, to, to weigh too much. So this is very unlikely that I will put a particle outside. The question is, can I put a particle in such a way that it sticks out just a little bit outside this gray cluster? And is this giving me a non-trivial contribution? The answer is yes. So I can create particles sticking out at a rate which is exponentially small in the sticking out area, which is the yellow area. And of course, this is a function of the local curvature. And we observe that the particles that give a non-trivial contribution to this birth rate are those that stick out of a linear uh, size uh, of beta to minus two thirds. And if we count how many of these boundary particles we can accommodate in a big disk, we will see that they are beta one third. So this is a very heuristic uh, uh, this, uh, interpretation that one can do uh, before uh, diving into the technicalities. Okay, so I hope I convince you that um, this is uh, um, reasonable. And now uh, let's look at, at what method we use in order to, uh, to uh, work on this problem. So the, the, the approach is the potential theoretic approach to metastability, which was initiated by a series of paper by Bouvier, Eckhoff, Gerard, and Klein in the early 2000s. And it's also the core of this monograph. And the main, um, the main, uh, um, the, the key idea is that there is uh, a link between the mean metastable time and the capacity of the two sets. In our case, the two sets are the empty torus and the full torus, where the capacity is in our case defined in this way, in terms of the probability that I first go to the full torus and then I go back to the 
then I go back to the empty torus. But um, okay, but in the next slide, we will see that uh, the beauty of this potential theoretic approach is that capacities can be uh, computed with variational formulas. So here I recall the grand canonical Gibbs measure written in terms of uh, uh, with, this, with, the, with this choice of the chemical potential. So you see that uh, we have the, the, the high intensity Poisson point process, which is trying to spread the points everywhere. But I have these Boltzmann factor, which really want them to stick all together. So there is this competition. So as I said before, the capacity is, is, is can be obtained as an infimum and as a supremum of something which is uh, in, the, in the first case is the Dirichlet form. So I can use, we can use the Dirichlet principle to have an upper bound and the, and the Thomson principle to have a lower bound. So the infimum is over all the functions which are one on the empty torus and zero on the full torus. And the supremum is over all the functions such that um, the generator applied to F is smaller or equal than zero. And actually it's a bit more complicated than, than the Dirichlet form itself. There is this ratio, but okay, now I don't want to put too much emphasis in these technicalities, but this is the Thompson principle and this is the Dirichlet principle. Uh, here I, I wrote the, the Dirichlet form associated with our dynamics, which is this dynamics of birth and death. Because of reversibility, the dynamics can be written basically in terms of the birth rate uh, altogether. So what we observe is that it turns out that the capacity is given at the main order um, is the probability that the shape, that, that the volume of the halo is close to the volume of the critical disk um, is, so their difference is actually less than something of the order beta minus two thirds. So th this is the first step. Okay, well, the first step is that you so we observe that um, that the, the 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 main contribution to the capacity is coming from the configurations where the volume of the halo is close to the volume of the critical disk. So now the second step is, of course, okay, we focus on this probability and we see what we can do via large deviations. First thing to do is uh, to identify what are the, uh, the admissible hollow shapes. I will not enter into de details because it's very intuitive. What are the possible hollow shapes? They're going to be union of disks, so clouds of, uh, of this type. Um, and I will define S minus to be the one interior of S. What is the one interior? I, I go down by one from all these uh, points in the surface and I find this, um, this kind of shape and the interior is this one. So this is S minus and this is S. Okay, so with these ingredients, now, now I would like to state the first result, which is a large deviation principle. So let's look at the volume of the, of the halo. The volume of the halo is a random variable, V of gamma. If I compute the probability uh, that V gamma is belong to some set, this is a family of probability measures. Mu is the Gibbs uh, measure, parameterized by beta. And this family satisfies the large deviation principle on uh, the, mm, the real positive real line with the rate beta and with the rate function I star. So I star is given as the infimum of a certain mm, function I of S, which is defined as um, the, 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 the surface of S minus kappa, the surface of S minus minus something constant, okay? This is uh, in order to for I to be normalized. So if I take the infimum of I of S with a fixed um, uh, area A, then I get that I star of A is my rate function. So informally, what I'm saying is that the probability that um, the volume is equal to, to some va value A is, circa exponential of minus beta i star of a. 
this is the informal version of the large deviation result. And we prove this uh, taking some ideas from a uh, paper by Schreiber and using the contraction principle. Um, so the the second, yeah. Sorry, but large deviations require some asymptotics, but what is asymptotics here? Something um, to infinity. Well. So the, the so the, the asymptotic is written here. So um you see that the, the I'm I'm saying that the rate is beta and the rate function is this. So ah. that then the 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 large then it's the usual large, large deviation principle, which if you want, uh, I wrote in this way. So this exponential asymptotics is valid for one something tends to infinity. What tends to infinity? So in my in our case, it's beta that is going to infinity. Beta. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yes, if like, beta, like, beta is going to infinity and, and the torus is fixed. So exactly. this is constant. Uh, 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 thank you. This is constant. So beta, beta is constant. No, no, beta is, uh, is varying. It's uh -huh. varying. And uh, uh, so this is going to infinity, but uh -huh. this is telling you how it's going to infinity with beta. Uh, thank you. Actually, mm -hmm. actually, this is not going to infinity, but the time is, uh, is going to go to infinity because it's one over this. Okay. So beta is going to infinity, the torus is fixed. That's why this is constant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so the, now, now we, we have a large deviation result. And what we have to do now is to find the infimum of this um, function here. So again, this function is the, the shape, the, the area of S minus kappa times the area of this one uh, interior of S. And we have um, a result which is of the um, isoperimetric kind. Uh, so we, we, we see that uh, the minimum of this function is obtained when, so the, the minimizers actually are disk of the radius r. So if, uh, if I fix the area to be pi r squared, the minimum of this is uh, this one. So the minimums, the, the, minim, the, the minimizers are disk. This is the first result. And the second result is that the minimizers are stable. So if the, uh, my rate function is close to its minimum more than epsilon, something of the order epsilon, then the one interior is connected and simply connected. And the Hausdorff distance between the, their uh, contours is smaller than something of the order square root of epsilon. It looks complicated, but with this second uh, result, one can uh, uh, exclude with high probability to have um, um, holes inside this cloud of particles. So here I'm saying that there are no holes, that this cloud of particles is very, um, is very um, dense. So let's see what we can do with these two ingredients that we have now. So we have, uh, we have seen that for every value of R of the, of the radius, we have that the I star uh, of pi R square is equal to the, which is equal to the I of BR. So remember that I star is the uh, rate function for the volumes and I is the rate function for the shapes. So this is given by this formula, which we found via large deviations. And the phi cap of R is the is the downward parabola, which was uh, um, in the in the main theorem uh, uh, slide. Okay, and now what can we do? We would like to to reach our uh, our target. So in order to reach our target, we we need to zoom in on a neighborhood of the critical droplet. So I would like to choose R critical equal R equal to R critical, and apply the the large deviation principle. So. Uh, the large deviation principle, I can write it in this way, but when some epsilon is fixed, but what we would like to do, if you remember, is to take epsilon that is converging to zero um, and with like beta to minus two thirds, but this is not possible to obtain via large deviations. So the large deviation is the first step in order to understand what is the main uh, term, but in order to capture the term of order beta one third, we have to do a more refined analysis. So the next step is to do the following. 
I guess that this is the main term, e to beta i of b are critical. Um, I multiply by the, the thing that I wanted to compute. I, I have the feeling that this uh, object is going to be of the order beta one third, uh, e to the beta one third. So then I take the log and I divide by beta one third, and I try to uh, compute asymptotics of this object. How do we do that? We can do that by controlling what is going to be the mesoscopic fluctuations of the surface of the critical droplet. So these are uh, related to the fluctuations of these uh, um, very um, irregular and random boundary of this critical droplet. Okay, so this is, I, I hope I convinced you that this is now the, the main issue. So we have two results. The first one is, um, is a rough asymptotics, and the second one is a sharp asymptotics. So for the rough asymptotics, it's rough in the sense that when uh, um, we take beta to infinity, the limb soup is uh, not uh, um, um, exa exactly the same as the limb inf, in the sense that the, the, the dependency on kappa is the same, but we have different constants. So here I, I wrote explicitly where this constant tau star comes from. It comes from the solution of this equation, why c is a less explicit constant. Um, so here we are not very satisfied because we don't have uh, a sharp uh, uh, asymptotics. So, so what we would like to do is we would like to have something a bit better. And we can do it, but paying the price of, uh, of, uh, of some technical assumptions. So uh, the theorem uh, about sharp asymptotics is really what we want to have. So again, the probability that my um, volume is close to the volume of the critical droplet less than something of the order beta to minus two thirds is, um, is, uh, is this exponential where I have the, the rate function times beta, uh, beta to one third times another function of kappa times smaller orders. Um, for uh, some uh, um, constant uh, tau double star, which uh, together with tau star uh, is, is involved in the definition of this psi kappa. Okay, and this one is the rate function, the usual one. Um, so, um, but this is obtained under certain assumptions, technical assumptions, which I didn't want to write down. Um, so, let me let me uh, summarize a little bit. So the large deviations and the moderate deviation in this sense uh, theorems, both the sharp and the rough asymptotics are uh, part of this uh, preprint. And um, what we are going to do next is we are we want to um, to uh, prove that these certain assumptions are, are satisfied. The certain assumptions are related to uh, fluctuations again of the surface of this critical droplet, but on a microscopic scale, on a much uh, uh, lower, uh, a much uh, um, more mi microscopic scale. So when I zoom in, and uh, they come, so these certain assumptions come from uh, somehow the fact that if I zoom in on the surface, what I see is that there is an effective microscopic interface model to study. And we, in, towards the end of the talk, maybe I'm going to give you an idea of the fact that, that these constants come from the free energy of this effective microscopic interface model that I obtain when I zoom in in the vicinity of the surface. Okay, so, okay, so how much time do I have? Uh, I think you can take five minutes at least, right? Okay, very good. So uh, I will yeah. say just a few words about um, the, the, the ideas of the proof. So the proof is very long and uh, technical, but there are some ideas which are uh, key, uh, the key points. And let's see what I can, uh, what I, I can manage to do in five minutes. So the first idea is the following. So imagine that you have to compute integrals 
on the whole space of configurations. This is very heavy. Um, so the first idea is to have a reduction. We know that in the end, the configurations are always uh, um, these uh, clouds of particles without, uh, uh, without holes in the inside. So if you give me a configuration S, I can do always the following thing. From the configuration, from the shape S, I can always tell you what are these boundary points. So given S, I know what Z1, Z2, Zn are, where they are boundary points. And N is random, of course. So what I would like to do, the first key, key step is to write this integral as an integral over a collection of boundary points. So you have to imagine that instead of integrating over the whole surface, I can integrate over this necklace, so basically where the pearls are these boundary points. So the key step is, uh, is written here in this very complicated formula, but, but uh, never mind, because the whole point here is that the probability that the shape belongs to some set of constraints A, it can be written in the following way. I take outside the main contribution because I know what the main contribution is. And then, okay, here I have the, the usual Poisson, uh, this, this sum over n uh, kappa beta to the n divided by n factorial comes from the Poisson uh, uh, measure. And then I have the integral over all the admissible collections of boundary points. So over all these um, kind of necklaces. And what I have here now, is that in the exponential, I have kind of a surface term because I have the, the real function minus the rate function. And this is a surface contribution. And no matter what these uh, uh, constraints are, could, could also have complicated and uh, constraints, I can always uh, write these, these in this way. And this is going to be very useful together with the second idea because now I have a surface term of this kind where delta um, is this function and A is a collection of a lot of constraints, which I have used in order to, to reduce uh, the, the, the integral. So, but because of the, because we are in the continuum and everything is symmetric, um, it, it makes a lot of sense to use polar coordinates for these uh, kind of uh, integrals. So each, um, each, each center of these boundary points at I can be written in, in polar coordinates where R is given by some uh, rho I, which is very small because uh, uh, the, the radius is clearly R critical minus one. Um, Okay, so once I've used polar coordinates, I can expand everything that depends on these boundary points in terms of these new polar coordinates. And we are going to interpret these integrals as expectations of functionals of random variables, where these ti are going to be a Poisson point process with the intensity of the order beta one third, which are going to be these angular uh, coordinates. And the number of particles is a Poisson random variable with uh, this parameter. And these uh, coordinates rho i are going to be um, Brownian bridges normalized with the square root of beta. So in this way, when, once I have rewritten these uh, formulas and expectation with respect to these auxiliary point processes, I can do again an analysis via large deviations. Okay, I will conclude because uh, um, uh, maybe I can finish with the microscopic fluctuations. <laughs> so um, this formula is very complicated. So don't look at that if you uh, are tired. Um, so what I want to, uh, to just to say is that, uh, as I said before, um, the analysis for the mi microscopic fluctuations is, uh, is linked to the existence of, uh, of uh, this uh, um, effective model, which is uh, called parabolic interface model. So uh, basically, it's a one-dimensional uh, um, 
process. So where, where, where you have where the phi i are heights and the ti are points on, um, on z. Actually, they are not points on z, they are points on r. And um, this is the um, uh, partition function for this uh, model. The important thing is that this is, these are nearest neighbor interaction. But the important thing is that uh, um, we have uh, a, a constraint on the set on the admissible set of configurations, which is coming from the fact that this is a model for these boundary points. So we are going to say that um, that uh, this, the configurations uh, um, that are going to be accepted are those where every couple T and phi are ex extremal. And this extremality constraint is uh, um, taken from uh, the paraboloid growth process introduced um, in uh, the context of stochastic geometry by Kalka, Schreibel, and Jukic. So uh, where we say that the point is extremal, if when it's erased, the, the area underneath uh, this uh, uh, union of, uh, of downward parabola becomes smaller. So uh, this is a way to, to translate. Um, so for instance, this one is not extreme at this point, because if I raise it, I don't uh, uh, lower the area underneath this downward parabola. And this is a way to um, interpret this uh, boundary configurations in terms of, uh, uh, of um, a paraboloid growth process. Um, with this, I will stop because uh, uh, I think I have already taken a lot of time and we can maybe discuss um, in later in the break. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Elena, for the nice talk. And uh, I will ask uh, the audience if there are any questions. Maybe a uh, one quick Sorry, question. cannot you show once more the, the main result, which was first? Now, what is the, the, the probability of something you have studied? What is the, the, symptom, what, the asymptotics of what you studied? In the, just in the um, beginning. In the okay. beginning of the, yes. Do you mean uh, this in one? The beginning. Uh, you the studied, beginning? Uh, it's a circuit. Uh, before, what is the, what is the first? You can consider, consider activity larger than critical, yes? Okay. Activity yes, let, larger let than critical. Uh, yes. So this uh, is the main yeah. theorem, right? Activity larger than critical. And then uh, and then what you say that typical configuration uh, in what uh, typical configuration in, in liquid phase, it is what it is it is it is circle. Uh, no, no. So here no, here, here the, the result is about the mean time the system needs to condensate. But maybe you're referring to this to this one, right? Yes. So 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 this this theorem is telling you that on the top, so on the settle point, when when this system is condensating, is about to condensate, then uh, um, we we can say that that the shape that the system is taking is the following. So the disk are arranged in such a way that they are like a big disk. And you will see beta inside, um, beta in the bulk and beta to the one third on the boundary. This is the result. There are two, two things which are not, uh, it, what was this two, tau, two, two black and two white, two, two, two random variables. What is it, two black okay. and two white? So the tau, so what so the white box is the configuration. Let, let me go to this uh, slide. So the white uh -huh. box is the empty configuration. Uh, one can suppose that the empty configuration is a very rarefied gas, gas, no? And the black box is the configuration where uh, all the particles cover completely the torus. Now, of course, if you take uh, that uh, the black box is say half of the torus is also okay. Okay, but what, what we want to say is that we start from a configuration where you are uh, really rare effect. In, uh, in fact, you have no particles. You started these dynamics which creates and delete particles. And uh, uh, you want to, to, to find the time you need to cover completely the torus. Mm -hmm. Okay, the point is that uh, um, 
when uh, uh, the system will start to create a droplet and then it will disassemble it because it's thermodynamically not convenient. And then it will restart. And this is a very long, pro uh, long process. It's going to, to go back and then until it's going to reach this critical droplet. And after this critical size, it will condensate quickly. And, and, you, and, you, and you claim that uh, just before this uh, system reached this black state, can you show once more this result about the droplet? About yes. the droplet. Now, that you, before this system reached this black state, yeah. but, the, but with the condition which is not, did not reach the empty condition before the, the empty is not reached before black, yes? There's condition for no, ability. No, 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 no. No, the 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 white uh, configuration is reached one million time before it goes to the black configuration. But here you see that I'm saying that if I condition, there is going to be a moment where I actually go to the black uh, um, box, and uh, when it's the good time that I go to the black box, then on top of the uh, of the hill, I am going to see this configuration with probability one. Asymptotically for beta that goes to infinity. But why this condition? What, what means this condition that uh, time of time of reaching empty have to be larger than time? Yes. Ah, I understand your question now. Okay, because uh, I have to leave the starting state. Huh? So this is the this is the return time. I ah, have come, time. Okay, I, I understand your conclusion. You're right. This is the return time. So before I return to the to the um, to the empty configuration. Uh huh. Mm? Uh huh. Thank you. That's, okay. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Understand. Thank. You. Yes. So, I think we don't have time for further questions. So let's uh, all thank uh, Elena again for a very nice talk. Thank you. Sorry for the problems with the internet. No, no, the talk was really good anyway. I suggest we take maybe just a couple of minutes to refresh and then, uh, and then we continue with the second talk. Maybe Frank, you can start sharing the screen. Okay, I think uh, we can start also because we are a bit uh, late with the time.
Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Frank Den Hollande. We all know Frank. is a distinguished professor of mathematics and probability at Leiden University. And uh, uh, Frank's uh, specialties uh, are in probability theory, stochastic processes, and mostly uh, statistical mechanics, uh, where he, he put a lot of uh, great and innovative contributions. And let me mention also a number of, uh, of awards and honors that I wasn't aware before, but I found on Wikipedia. And uh, I, I discovered that Frank is a knight of the order of the Netherlands lion, which is something quite, uh, quite remarkable. And also elected fellow of the American Mathematical Society and uh, elected fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. It is, of course, uh, then a great pleasure that we have uh, Frank giving a, a talk uh, still on the subject of metastability for the widom rollison model. And now we will look uh, into grains of uh, general shape. Thank you, uh, Frank, for accepting the invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you also to both of you for, for inviting uh, us to uh, to speak at the seminar and uh, thank you for all of you to come and listen so <clears throat> um elena explained how when you do a widom rawlinson model on the plane for uh, particles that have a disk shape uh, how uh, that model in, uh, shows an interesting uh, condensation phenomena and she showed in, uh, in detail what the condensation time is, when you are about to condense, what the system looks like. This was this critical droplet, which is close to a disk that has some kind of bumpy <clears throat> random uh, boundary. <clears throat> and, um, and she was uh, showing also some of the techniques that you need to uh, do, and there are quite a number of them, large deviation techniques, mesoscopic fluctuations, uh, microscopic fluctuations, in order to really describe that phenomenon. Now, <clears throat> what we want to do next is to say, what would happen if we would be in the plane and we would not consider disks, but some other uh, shape, for instance, squares or triangles or ellipses <clears throat> or other objects. And at the same time, what would happen if we move from two to higher dimensions and maybe think of uh, general shapes, not spheres, but other objects in higher dimensions? Can you then still do something? <clears throat> and the answer is yes. But at the same time, we have to be more modest because once you deal with general shapes, uh, life becomes uh, a bit harder. So what we're going to do is to give some uh, simple, or let's say simpler results than the results that uh, Elena talked about. We're going to speculate about what could be happening beyond those sim simple results. And at the same time, we're going to see that some surprises are coming up. And so what I'm going to do is to very rapidly sort of recap uh, the, the, the main uh, line that uh, Elena was, uh, was discussing, and then uh, see how from these disks in the plane, we can go to convex grains in, in dimensions two or higher and see what happens. And <clears throat> And we're going to stick with the same type of model that uh, Elena was talking about. I will remind you uh, of that. And then uh, we're going to see how we can go uh, from there. So Elena was showing, and I'm going to first <clears throat> show the, 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 the pictures again, what, we, what would happen when we would be sitting in the plane on a finite torus. So I'm going to remind you very quickly of the pictures that, that she showed. Uh, you have uh, a finite torus. The torus is large enough to be able to have interesting things happening inside the torus, but it is 
uh, considered to be finite. <clears throat> and then you can throw in points, uh, these, these uh, point processes, and then you can count how many points there are. And uh, that was given by N uh, gamma. Gamma was a point configuration and N gamma was the number of points. And then you can draw unit disks around them. And there was this halo, which is this gray region that uh, she was talking about. And she was introducing a grand canonical Gibbs measure. So this is a Gibbs measure on all possible uh, configurations of these particles with their halo. And it was built on a number of very basic ingredients. There is a process, a Poisson process with intensity one. And this is what you would see if there would be no interaction between these disks whatsoever. You are going to uh, have a, a chemical activity parameter that is that you use to uh, tune the density of particles in here. So every particle that comes in uh, uh, has a cost Z. And by playing with Z, uh, you can put bring in more or less particles in the system. There is a, uh, an inverse temperature that always appears in front of a Hamiltonian. And then there is a normalizing partition sum. And the Hamiltonian is an attractive Hamiltonian. As she said, you just take the total volume of the halo uh, and you subtract from that the, the total volume of all of the disks uh, separately. And so this is a kind of overlap, and this is a negative Hamiltonian, and uh, this causes that the particles would like to overlap as much as possible, but the reference measure, the Poisson measure, doesn't like that and wants to spread them out. So there is something interesting happening between particles wanting to overlap, but also being spread out because of uh, this uh, Poisson measure. And then there is another parameter Z with which you can tune the total density of the particles. So this is a, a model in which you can play with various particles and see what happens. And um, Elena showed this picture that in the activity versus inverse temperature plane, there is a, a critical curve. This curve becomes really sharp if the torus would be the full infinite plane. Uh, and there is some sort of threshold critical temperature. And when you're above that, you will see that uh, when you are above this critical uh, value beta, you, there is a, a curve that cuts in the Z beta plane. And uh, if the activity is high enough, uh, you will see a liquid. And if you are, uh, if the activity is, is low enough, you will see a vapor. And, and, and uh, there, there is, the, and on this line, there is coexistence between the two. And th there's a, there, the, the, the rigorous theory about that was, uh, she cited these papers who, who for the first time really proved this. <clears throat> and we're going to come back to, uh, to the fact that there is that phase transition also later when we are going to replace the disks by something else. Okay. Uh, one thing that uh, Elena did not speak about and that will be useful for us to realize is that you can think of the widem rawlinson model as uh, 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 you can think of it in a different way. Uh, this interaction Hamiltonian is a bit peculiar. Maybe if you first see it, you say it's the total overlap of, of all the... Uh, of all the particles, where is this coming from? Well, there you can also think of a model in which you have two types of particles, blue particles and red particles, that have a disk uh, of radius one half, not one, and you'll see in a second why. And you could think of a model in which there is a very simple interaction. Um, uh, it's a hardcore repulsion that says red particles may overlap, Blue particles may overlap, but red and blue particles may not overlap. So if I have a model where there is only one type of interaction, namely red and blue have to stay away from each other, then it happens that if you would draw around all the red particles a, a sphere of radius one, 
then this sphere is the forbidden region for the centers of the blue particles, because if the center of the blue particle would enter this gray region, it would start to overlap with the red ones. And so what happens if I look at the right picture and I would close one eye and I would not be able to see the blue disks anymore and I would only see the red disks, then what happens is that the red disks will have an interaction that is exactly the Wynnum Rowlandson interaction as um, Elena introduced it. And so why is the, 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 the Wynnum Rowlandson model attractive if particles red particles overlap more and more, they leave more space for the blue particles to move around in, and that's why their probability uh, distribution is higher because they're, um, I'm integrating over a bigger region where the blue particles can be. So put into a, a, a very quick form, the you can think of the one species Wynnum Rowlandson model as the projection onto one of two species of a two species model in which the only interaction is hardcore revulsion. And that's a nice way to think. And we will see later when we come to more general shapes that we have to uh, come back to this uh, picture again to understand what the interaction is going to do for more general shapes. Okay, so let's. Uh, so what this says is that behind the one species Wynnum Rowlandson model, there's also a two species uh, hard disk model. And when Elena was talking about uh, uh, the condensation, what this actually means is that when you are in your two species model, you will see a segregation, a separation of the two species. Here, they're all sort of mixed. And here they would be all rolled up. So, uh, uh, and, and there is this, uh, uh, the phase transition corresponds in the two species pictures from something where you say you're all mixed or you're all sort of rolled up. And this would be in the two species model, um, Elena's um, uh, critical droplet that you uh, would get uh, when you do the phase separation. Okay, so let's go back to, to the, uh, the, the, the one species model. Uh, uh, this grand canonical uh, distribution is the standard static Wynnum Rowlandson model. And Elena was adding a dynamics to this model. And this dynamics was allowing particles to move in and particles to move out. And it, she did that with certain birth rates and death rates. And every particle, no matter where it is and in what configuration it is currently living, has a rate one of dying. But a particle can, in a configuration gamma, be born at a, at a, vert at a site X, and it will do that in a certain way. Uh, and this is way is chosen exactly such that um, the grand canonical uh, distribution of the static Wyndham Rowlandson model is the the reversible equilibrium of this dynamics. And this dynamics is very simple. If you bring in a particle, you have to pay a cost Z for every particle, but you also change the Hamiltonian because you add a particle. And so the change in the Hamiltonian is the, the, the this difference uh, of, of the Hamiltonian before and after you've put a particle in and you weigh that with the Boltzmann uh, factor. And that's what you have to pay to create a particle. Okay, um, uh, and what uh, Elena then said, well, uh, th there is this crossover from, uh, from empty to full. What we want to do is to place our parameters such that we're just above the critical line in the liquid phase. So the system wants to be a liquid, but I'm going to prepare the system such that it is a vapor. And I'm going to ask myself, okay, you are a vapor. You would like to become a liquid. How do you do that? You would have to sort of tunnel across this phase transition uh, curve in the course of time. And how long is that, that taking? And that is what she was describing. And she said, let's start with an empty torus. Well, the empty torus has no particles. So this is 
a perfect caricature for low density gas. There's not even any particle around. And then she said, let's wait until we see the entire torus filled. Well, a full torus is a caricature of a liquid. It's, 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 um, it's something where you say, okay, everything is filled. So it's, we're at the complete opposite end. And she was saying, well, how long does it take for me to go from an empty to a full torus? And th thinking of that, that, that describes the condensation from a, from a caricature vapor state to a caricature gas state. So that is why we look at these two configurations as the beginning and the end of our dynamics and saying, how long does it take? And she also pointed out, yeah, I could start to something that is similar, like, like uh, empty or similar to us, doesn't matter. But we take these very two simple beginning and end configuration and say that for us represents a transition from a gas state to a liquid state. And the question was, well, how long does that take? In the limit as beta goes to infinity, you need to take um, uh, a limit as, uh, as Sergei was pointing out again in his questions. Uh, major stability is always a phenomenon where you have to take some sort of limit and our limit is a limit of low temperature. And because of our choice here, it is also a limit of high density. And the question is, you fix the torus, make it large enough, but fixed, pick a kappa, so please choose how far you are above the critical curve and then let beta go to infinity and see what happens. And uh, Elena argued that what you will see is that when you finally go over from the gas state, which for us means an empty torus, to the liquid state, which for us means a full torus, you will have to pass through one particular configuration, which is a critical disk of a certain size that could be anywhere between one and a large number, depending on how you pick your parameters. And you will see that you, you will uh, almost fill this circular disk. You cannot, with unit spheres, perfectly fill this. So there is a bumpy boundary. But the bumpiness of the boundary is can be computed and quantified, and this boundary is very thin, and most of the particles uh, are almost filling this uh, box. And there are about beta uh, disks inside, and they're of order of beta to the one third disks touching the boundary. And these were these two terms were exactly responsible for what she showed in the in the um, in the uh, Arrhenius formula. And so the message is, on your way from the gas to the liquid, you must pass with a probability tending to one through this droplet. Of course, there are other ways of filling the torus. You could just fill it row by row, but that is too costly. And the statement is, with a probability tending to one as beta goes to infinity, you will have to go through this droplet. And this droplet is the hardest thing for you to create because once you've created it, all the other disks are going to rain on top of it and are going to just fill the, 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 the torus. And if, but until you've reached this, you will not have climbed up high enough. So you first create a few small droplets and you remove them again. And you create another few small droplets and you remove them again. And it's a, it's a difficult process in which you, you return to the gas state many, many, many times until finally, after a very long time, you recreate an object that is like this and then you're over the hill. And, and I gave a very precise description of this uh, object. And in particular, she was also showing that uh, how long does it take to reach this? And there was a volume term of order beta and there was a surface term of order beta to the one third. And, and lo and behold, for this planar disk model, these, uh, these uh, constants in the Arrhenius formula, which she called the volume free energy and the surface free energy are computable 
n are simple functions of this parameter kappa, which is the degree of supersaturation uh, that we're having. So kappa was the factor by, by how much we are above the, the critical curve. Okay, and she also explained that this was a, a you know a very uh, difficult computation to do because you need to uh, use large deviation principles, variational uh, principles, uh, isoperimetric inequalities, and there's a long story behind it. But in the end, you end up with a very nice formula in which all the objects can be quantified. Okay. Um, now, uh, what I'm going to address uh, in the rest of this talk is what happens when the grains uh, uh, stop being disks and what would happen if we would go to higher dimension. And this is a question that uh, uh, Roman Katetsky and, and, uh, and Yogesh, um, who is present, uh, is... Um, no, and, and, and I have been thinking about, um, it was clear to us from, from the beginning that, you know, a full detailed picture, like Elena was painting it, is going to be, uh, for the moment, beyond our reach. Uh, because if you start to make your grains non-spherical, well, life is going to become much harder even and imagine even the the things that Elena was talking about for 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 spheres in in three dimensions hard computations however uh if we're a bit more modest we we can say a few things uh, when the grains are convex and and partly to our our surprise uh interesting things are happening that we did not expect to happen for instance, we're going to ask ourselves, what would this critical droplet look like when the grains are no longer spherical? Is it going to still be uh, circular or is it not? And the answer is no, interesting things are happening and, and also some surprises are happening. And so uh, diving into this problem, has its uh, has its rewards because new things appear to be happening and by doing this where we're actually entering the world of granular media granular media is is a is a big area in 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 physics where they say the objects the microscopic objects have a shape they're not point particles and uh, there are interesting phenomena where you say what the system is doing on a macroscopic scale is determined by the microscopic geometry of the particles. So when the particles are not disk shape or could be sort of more elongated, this can cause all sorts of uh, interesting macroscopic um, uh, behavior that are really deeply linked to the uh, underlying microscopic uh, geometry. And so with the questions that we're, we're dealing with here, we are sort of moving into this area uh, in, from the point of view of metastability. Fine, so that's the setting where we are in. And I'm going to introduce uh, a number of objects. And let me emphasize again, <laughs> we're sticking with the exact same model as uh, Elena was talking about, the only thing that we're changing is the shape of, the, uh, of these particles. They're no longer disks in a plane, but they can be, so it turns out to be uh, compact convex sets in, um, in, in any dimension. So we need to talk about the, the uh, configuration now, for us, a configuration now consists of the points that are the centers of our objects, but we, it also uh, comes with having to give every point a shape. When we were still talking about disks, every point got the same shape around it, which was the unit uh, disk. Now, we are saying, no, a configuration consists of, first of all, 
centers of migraines and then also shapes of migraine. So my, uh, my halo is now, uh, you, you do all centers and all sorts of shapes that together form what we call a configuration, which is a somewhat richer object than what we had before. And this is the halo of all these objects because around the point X, there is a shape K and X plus K is then the shape that is at attached with that point X. And the union of all of these over our configuration is going to be the halo. So it's the same as before, but now we must also talk about uh, shapes around the different points. And you could say, well, why don't you pick one shape and use that shape all the time? We could do that, but we're going to even allow this shape to be random so that different points may have different shapes. Okay, we're going to talk about different uh, examples. Okay, so this is the halo and we're going to use exactly this object uh, in the definition of uh, of the um, of the of the model. Now we have to talk about what shapes do you allow to pick. We introduce stripped kappa as the collection of all compact convex sets whose interior contains the origin. We want the center of of these shapes to be in lying inside these shapes, and we're going to pick a probability distribution script the, the, the double bar s on this collection so you have a collection of possible compact sets and you have a, a, a way of drawing randomly from this set and we're going to do that independently and it turns out if you go back to this picture of the two species where did the uh, interaction hamiltonian in the Wynnum Rawlinson come from, it came from you throwing down red disks and blue disks and only requiring the blue and red not to overlap. And then you would only look at the red and you would integrate out over the blue. If you do that now for more general objects than the disks, you take, uh, you take your halo these are, let's say, your, your red disks, and this is the halo of your red disks. And you have to sort of keep track of what the blue particles could not, in, in what way they could not approach you. And the way you get that is because you make you take the Minkowski sum of this halo with minus k, because you see the uh, you see your blue disks. Uh, in in a in 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 a, in a flipped way. That's why the minus appears here, and then you integrate out over all possible shapes that you could do. Every point has an independent draw from this set of compact convex sets of the shape, and then this is the effective Hamiltonian where you say I had my red halo and I'm integrating out over what the blue particles could be. So. The, the halo function now is something, uh, the Hamiltonian is now something a little bit more complicated, but completely explicit and involves a probability distribution that you have to choose. And, um, but otherwise it is a, a, a completely similar object than we had before. And in particular, if, you always pick a fixed shape. So the probability distribution on a, on, on, of, of your random shape is just a point measure on a particular uh, K. Then this Hamiltonian is just, uh, you, you uh, put around every point in gamma, you just put uh, the, uh, a set and that is the, the, the set K, Minkowski sum, minus k. So this is like if in the standard Wynnum Rawlinson model k is a ball with radius one half, then this becomes a ball of radius one. And that's why we were uh, talking about uh, unit disks in the Wynnum Rawlinson model. But now if you make a more general k, you have to think of a set like this. This is no longer a ball, but it is some symmetric set. Uh, and that is the one that you have to put around 
your points in order to get your Hamiltonian. And otherwise, the model is completely the same, not changed at all. There's the same grand canonical uh, probability measure. There's the same dynamics of particles entering and uh, exiting the box. No change. The only thing that has changed is the shape of the particles and therefore also the Hamiltonian because it looks at a particular way of putting shapes around the centers and that's it. So <clears throat> now we have this model and say, okay, what can we say about it? We begin by saying, well, is there a phase transition at all? Because uh, with the standard William Robinson model, we said, yeah, there is, uh, uh, there is a phase transition in the, in the static uh, model, and then we're going to position ourselves parameter-wise close to this critical curve and then start to say what happens when, uh, when I want to cross over this term dynamically. So is there a phase transition at all for this model? Well, we know there is in dimension uh, two and, and higher if, there, if I would have disk. Is it true again here? And the answer is yes. So the very first thing that we prove is that uh, if we assume that our randomly chosen shape always contains a tiny ball, doesn't matter how small this ball is. So if the probability that your random shape contains a little ball is equal to one, then you will have a phase transition between a liquid phase and a vapor phase for beta large enough. Uh, it is, will be more difficult to exactly say what this phase transition is, but there is definitely a phase transition. So we are in business to start to uh, do metastability. And this uh, proof is not very difficult. You can, to, you can, to a large extent, just copy uh, the argument that is being used uh, for, for disks. And in fact, you compare it with, uh, with a percolation model. And so there's a comparison uh, with percolation, and then you, you can show that there is a phase transition because there is also a um, a a transition in a percolation model. So there, there are links with what, uh, what are called the um, random cluster model. Okay, good enough. So we're in business. We can start to talk about, uh, uh, again, there is a liquid phase and there is a vapor phase. What happens when we try to play the same game? What is happening? And <clears throat> our first result is a statement that is a very rough version of what uh, Elena was describing. It says, if you are again asking the question, how long does it take for you to go from a torus where there is no grain at all to, uh, uh, to a, a, a configuration in which the grains that are no longer disks are all covering the torus, then for very large beta, we're always in the large beta regime. This is approximately beta times a certain volume, free energy, plus something that is smaller. And this volume free energy is computable. It's computable in principle for every kappa, for every choice of how you randomly attach a shape to your points and uh, and we're going to talk about this object and our result says well there is some higher order correction but we know that this higher order correction is going to be very complicated we have at this moment no hope that we could compute that surface term nonetheless i'm going to permit myself to speculate about what that term could be even though I don't think we'll have a chance to prove anything there, but we can speculate, we can dream, and I'm going to talk, talk about that. But for the leading order term, this is an, uh, a completely um, exact and, and uh, mathematically uh, precise result. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what this 
volume free energy would be in for different choices of this grain distribution and uh, also going to talk about well this volume free energy is is the volume free energy of a large droplet in the plain case with this this was something close to a sphere what is it going to become now because that shape will determine the value of this a number because this is the volume free energy of that critical shape the critical shape was the hardest thing for you to do and it corresponded and it was uh, it was having its own uh, volume free energy in the limit as beta goes to infinity and that uh, determines what this cost was. So let's take some examples. And so I'm going to give you uh, the results. I'm not going to uh, give you any proofs of this, but these proofs can be given. Um, let's do what we call a fixed convex grain. So you pick a fixed shape, and I say every point gets the same fixed shape there's nothing random anymore about the shape all grains have the same fixed shape k but k can be uh, an arbitrary compact uh, convex set then it turns out that the critical droplet uh, so the hardest thing for the system to create before it goes over the hill is actually a multiple of this same fixed shape k just like we had for the ball then we took if what Elena took was that k was the unit ball and then we said well the critical droplet is a radius of a certain ball uh, uh, is a ball of a certain radius and that is the same thing as saying well it's a multiple of the unit this well here we get the same thing we say your critical droplet has the same shape as the shape of all the grains but by a certain number it's blown up and this number is completely computable as a function of the parameter that describes the supersaturation uh, factor by which i am above my uh, critical curve and the surface sorry the volume free energy associated with this critical droplet can also be computed. It is the d minus first power of this radius and times the volume of a certain set. And this set is the set k star that we introduced before. It's k plus the Minkowski sum with k of k and minus k. And it is interesting to see that this volume free energy is a product term there is a, a term that depends on the shape of the grain that you take and there is a term that doesn't depend on the shape of this uh, grain at all it only depends on the parameter kappa uh, which says how meta stable am i actually so in this simple case you we have a, a completely explicit and simple form and there's a sort of a separation there's a there's a shape factor and there's a factor that depends on kappa and they are separated. Okay, now what we're going to do next is to say what happens if I go away from having just one uh, shape and I allow my shape to be random in some sense. So I can take a shape and then I can apply a random transformation to it which for which i use the symbol t then i get a new shape which is tk and i'm going to have some map on the i'm going to have some probability distribution on the 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 on the the, the on the transformations that i can apply to my shape and i will be interested in only two types of transformations namely i can rotate my shape so in that case this is just an angle distribution and this means i'm going to rotate my shape uh, uh, according to a certain angle 
And what you could also do is to have a random dilation. You could say, I'm not going to change the shape, but I'm going to shrink it or blow it up uh, according to a random factor. In this case, this phi would be a probability distribution on the positive half line describing by how much I would shrink or, or blow up my, my shape. So I'm going to ask the question, well, if you take a fixed shape, but you can rotate it randomly, uh, or you can dilate it randomly, what is going to happen? Can we still uh, compute um, uh, what, what the critical droplet is? And the answer is yes, and some interesting things are happening. The first thing that we say, well, you pick a shape and suppose that this phi would be the uniform rotation. So you can rotate it with equal probability over all angles um, in the plane from, two, two to, uh, from two, zero to two pi or in, in three dimensions, rotating it over all possible areas. Then it turns out that, interesting enough, no matter what shape you decided to start with, if you are allowed to randomly rotate it, so what does this mean? Every uh, vertex gets uh, the same shape, but possibly rotated uniformly. If you do that, your critical droplet becomes a ball. It's no longer a multiple of this shape. It becomes a ball. And there is, again, a prefactor in front of it, it is a ball of a certain radius. And this number depends, this radius depends on kappa, and it depends on the shape that you actually started out with, even though the whole thing is still a sphere, no matter what k you pick, but the, 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 the size of this sphere depends on k and it depends on kappa. And actually, the scaling in kappa is very similar. It's actually the same as what we had before, but the dependence on kappa is quite a bit more complicated. But what happens here is, if you take an arbitrary shape, but you're allowed to uniformly rotate it before you put it into the thing, your critical droplet is no longer a multiple of your shape, but it's a multiple of uh, a sphere. So random rotation turns the critical droplet into something different. It turns it into a sphere. Now you might say, yeah, okay, if I uniformly rotate it, yeah, I should have expected a sphere to happen. Yeah, reasonable. But the proof of this is non-trivial. To really prove that you have a sphere requires certain yeah, average, random average uh, isoparametric inequalities, if I would call them like that, that turn out to be a bit more, more delicate than meets the eye. Uh, and in order to prove this, uh, you really need to do some work. Now, what happens when I would start, uh, uh, for instance, taking a polygon? And I would rotate this polygon not uniformly. If I would completely uniformly rotate, I get a critical droplet that is uh, a sphere. But if I have a polygon, maybe I want uh, to rotate it over discrete number of angles. And in fact, uh, suppose I take a polygon and I rotate over finitely many angles that would somehow fit well with this polygon. For instance, the polygon could be a square, and then I say I'd like to rotate it over angle zero and, and, uh, and pi over four. Then it turns out that the critical droplet is again a polygon multiplied by a number, but this polygon need not be the same as the polygon that you start out with. It could be another polygon. So if you take a polygon and you rotate it over particularly chosen angles, then you may end up with still a polygon as a critical droplet, but not the same polygon, some under polygon. And for instance, if P is a square, 
and I allow rotations over angle zero and pi over eight. So this means I, I can just rotate the, um, the, uh, the angles. Uh, I can just turn it halfway down. Then, and I do that with equal probability, um, then uh, my critical droplet turns out to be a regular octagon rather than a square. Um, I'm suddenly thinking, should this be pi over four? I think this should actually be pi over four rather than pi over eight. Um, okay, the, the message is, if you start with a square and you're allowed to have this square in, let's say, two orientations, uh, then your critical droplet will turn out to be a multiple of an octagon. And, um, and this multiple can be computed and it has an interesting, uh, it has an in interesting dependence. So what we're saying is once you make your shape random by randomly rotating it or randomly dilating it, something can happen. And for instance, if you randomly dilate, something interesting is uh, also happen. If your shape would be symmetric and you have a random dilation, then your critical droplet is again a multiple of your original shape. But now this prefactor turns out to be more involved and it starts to depend on the first D moments of the distribution according to which you dilate your, your, um, your shape K. So again, the, we are able to say what the critical droplet is, but how big it is depends in a more delicate way on the way you choose your random dilation and also in, on the uh, parameter and there's no simple uh, factorization. So what have we seen? And, and I, I, I only have a few more slides to show to you. What we have seen is that the critical droplet can do something interesting, it can change shape, it can depend on the shape that you start out with, but it doesn't only depend on the shape, it also depends on possible random rotations and random dilations that I apply, and it's computable and certain interesting things are coming out that we are able to identify these objects and compute what they are, compute their, their, um, their uh, volume uh, uh, free energy, and that gives us the leading order behavior in the metastable behavior. Okay, now I'm going to uh, speculate and I'm, I still need five minutes and then I will close. Um, Aidan, I was talking about much more detailed results where there was also a surface uh, term correction because the critical droplet was full of these unit disks and, and, and the boundary was bumpy uh, and the, there were beta to the one third particles at the boundary. And well, that was describing a surface phenomenon. So if you wanted to have a more precise result, you need to look at surfaces. And the question now is, okay, uh, what, what happens at the surface of the critical droplets that I've just been talking about? They will again be certain shapes either K itself or an, a polygon that becomes another polygon or a sphere. And what, what is happening at the boundary of this sphere that should determine what is happening. And to capture this will be a huge challenge, but we can dream and we can certainly write down what we think should be happening here, even though we have no chance of writing it and Elena was mentioning that there was a, a primer, uh, an exponent one third. So let's conjecture that there's again going to be some lower exponent, some, some alpha to be identified and some sort of surface volume term. Can we speculate what this might be? And what I'm going to do in the last uh, two slides is only give you a uh, what this could be in, in two interesting cases, and it's only based on heuristics, but you know, careful heuristics, and 
no proofs uh, available and also really no proofs in sight, but a, a good thing to put forward. And we'll see that this alpha is interesting. So two examples, let's take spherical grains in D dimensions. Um, I'm going to do an argument. I'm going to skip it now, uh, and you're welcome to look at this, is to say, okay, uh, the, uh, Elena showed these little yellow regions. How much do particles uh, sort of stick out on the boundary? Let me give you straight away what we think uh, the answer is. We think that the exponent becomes D minus one over D plus one. And if D is equal to two, this is one over three, exactly the exponent that, uh, that Elena showed. And there's going to be a, a surface free energy that's going to scale like uh, in, as a function of kappa with this perfect factor. And there should be in front of here some uh, S dependent constant uh, that is probably very hard to compute. What would happen if I would take a polygon uh, and um, then it, we expect that the exponent is going to be zero and the scaling in kappa is going to be completely different. So what this would mean is that when you would start with a polygon, the correction term should be of order one rather than a, a, a power of beta. So for, uh, for spheres, this exponent is a certain number different from zero, but for polygons, we think that this will become zero so that the correction is, is of order one. And, and I'm going to close uh, this uh, talk now by saying, okay, in a nutshell, what we have done, we went from planar disks to more complicated convex grains whose shape could be random, random uh, dilated or randomly rotated, maybe over all possible angles or, or part of the possible angles. And we found that the Arrhenius formula sort of survives. It becomes uh, shape dependent. Uh, there was a term that we could compute. There was a term that we can only speculate about. And it is clear, uh, you know, once we look back now that you say, apparently, when you start to introduce grains of general shape, something interesting is happening. The critical droplet changes shape and size, and uh, there is an interesting volume uh, uh, free energy that is computable and highly non-trivial. And there is perhaps also a surface uh, term about which we could only speculate and so indeed, uh, also in this world of metastability, granular media really have a lot to offer and they bring in interesting mathematics and they bring in interesting new phenomena. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Frank, for a very inspiring talk. Uh, are the questions from the audience? One quick question, maybe. If not, I have several questions, but of course we are a bit out of time. So I will, I will at least make one. So you, you, you just spoke about having, uh, um, you know, one shape and then you rotate it or you dilate it. What if, have you thought about having uh, just two shapes and, uh, Pick, pick that random, like one half, one half. Uh, yes, these things can be introduced. For instance, when I was talking about polygons, uh, you could rotate over a finite number of angles. So I was mentioning you could take a square and then rotate it over zero and, uh, and pi over four. Yeah, I was um, thinking yeah. more about uh, you have one square and one uh, sphere. Yeah. And yeah. You have these two shapes. That uh, that is is interesting. Uh, we haven't uh, looked at that. Um, uh, yeah, that's an interesting thing. We haven't really dived yet deeply into what happens if you start to do more 
to your yeah. shape than doing rotation and, and dilations. And um, that would be an interesting thing because it, it, it looks to me uh, far from, from obvious uh, yeah. that what, what would be the final outcome. Uh, you know, it, 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 it could be some kind of thing in between uh, this shape and a sphere. Interesting question. We haven't done it. And, and, there, and you have to look at these isopyramidic inequalities involving different shapes and that is uh, is a non-interesting issue very good question I, I think we should try to go into this and and try to get to the bottom of this yeah it's very interesting the subject yeah. actually yeah. thank you very much for 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 this talk yeah so if uh, since we are out of time i would uh, really like to to thank both speakers uh, of today again for their very interesting talk thank you Okay, you're welcome. And uh, and we will see each other in two weeks for the next uh, okay. probability semi. So thank you so much for for inviting us. Thank you, Frank. And thank you. Yeah, Anna. thank you very much. Yes. Bye, everybody. Bye. I think you're still recording. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, not not anymore. Uh -huh. okay.